Hey guys, Ryan Earnhardt here from creativesoundlab.tv. Well, today I figured I'd do something a little different. And if this turns out to be kind of cool, uh, maybe I'll do it again. But I end up spending a lot of time on one topic. Um, you know, like right now, I'm uh, developing a vocal recording course and a vocal uh, mixing and producing course. And it's just like weeks on just one topic. And same thing with the YouTube videos. Uh, it's just a lot of time, you know, several hours on one topic, filming, editing. And I was noticing when going through the questions that I was just having conversations and it was kind of refreshing of like, oh yeah, this is this, and oh yeah, good question. You know, it's just really cool. So I figured um, I do just kind of like a rapid fire Q and A where I'm just gonna go through the questions that I haven't gotten to yet and I'm just going to try to answer them uh, unedited, uh, uncensored, just, hey, here's my answer. A lot of times I can remember stuff, uh, sometimes I can't, but I kind of surprise myself on, you know, people ask me questions, like very specific questions, and it's a video from 2015 or 2016, and they're asking me, what is this, or why did I do this? It, and it's, it's amazing what people think. Um, I don't know if they just don't realize that it's kind of an old video. But anyways, um, yeah, let's kick it off. Published comments I have not responded to. And this Phantom Power video, I don't even know when I did this. This must have been 2000, late, uh, 2017, probably. Uh, this guy says, uh, will it damage the passive mics like SM57s over time, though? I have an eight input USB interface and unfortunately four channels get power all at once. And I wanna rum more than four passive mics. I wouldn't mind some rum right now too. But I also have some active mics too. A fan of power is not gonna damage uh, dynamic mics. Now when I say dynamic mic, I mean moving coil. There's also a type of dynamic mic that because there's two types that are called ribbon mics, okay? And you really don't want to apply phantom power to those, but a, dy a dynamic mic that's moving coil, typically we just think of those dynamic mics, those uh, that don't see the phantom power, so you're fine. And, you know, I don't know why I picked the Rode K2 for this thumbnail. That is so stupid, because that's a tube mic. That doesn't even need phantom power. That has its own phantom uh, it has its own supply, so who knows why I made that thumbnail. Yeah, passive mics should be fine. Next question. You gotta try a Prologue mic. So interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't know what those are, but I remember somebody said there was like a $50 um, SM57 knockoff, and I hadn't tried that one yet. This was m like me modding the, the pile um, uh, SM7, uh, PD mic SM78, I think, or 78. Uh, so yeah, I haven't tried a, pro a prologue yet. Next question. How to mic a s snare drum demos if close? Right, so this is a, a video. Um, I, I would have done this probably in two, uh, 2016 in the uh, late spring, and I talked about the close mics kind of in a layered concept. So I talked about um, the sound of the snare drum is not just close mics, but it's also the overheads as well, and it's also the room mics as well, so there's actually three layers. This guy says, uh, I'd switch those mics, because the Shure SM57 is actually brighter than the i5. The i5, believe it or not, from what I've found, is actually quite dark, so I'd flip those two for me, less EQ2. Yeah, I don't know. I, the i5 is definitely brighter than the SM57, so I don't know. But go for it. If you find something that works, that's, that's fine. You don't need my permission or acknowledgement to do it. Uh, go for it, man. Snare mic shootout. Okay, this is a recent video. We did a, a bunch of different shots. This was one of the first videos I did in 4K, and you can see, I mean, just the colors, just how it looks. It's just, it's just so much better. I honestly can't believe how tight the pile sounded. It doesn't capture as much low overtone slash fullness. It has more expensive examples, but it has more sizzle than the SM57 I usually use. I got a snare that needs exactly that. For the price, I'm going to snag uh, one just to find out. You know, I, I don't know why people are obsessed with the high end. This is a kind of a novice mistake where 
you you think that oh this one is crystal clear and if you go look on um like online retailers that, that sell gear online and ship it out to people people that write reviews specifically online you'll hear a lot about crystal clear audio <laughs> and um i don't necessarily want crystal clear audio i want vibe i want good character um you know you can get crystal clear audio um but i don't even know what that means so a lot of people they get hung up on the pile sounding brighter and yes but at the same time it's not a very thick sound it's just not very substantial you could take a, a, a jolly rancher right and you could be like wow that's so much flavor like that like it, it's just like hard to even keep the piece of candy in my mouth well, right, but there's really not much to it. It's, it's like sugar and really intense flavor. Now, you go to maybe a, a meal that's cooked by a chef. Well, there's all sorts of flavors. Assist, um, uh, acidity, uh, yeah, acid, whatever. Acid, fat, salt, you know, there's just balance of the acid versus the salt versus the sugar, you know. And there's actually a lot more depth there. So as you get more developed in your ears, you start to realize that it's actually more important to notice uh, the mid-range, the lows, the upper mids especially, and kind of how it will sit and behave in the context of a mix. Uh, next question, uh, how to compress drum overheads tricks for setting the attack and release. Yeah, this is one that I just kind of like uh, set up and just, you know, ready, set, go. And um, somebody actually sounded uh, uh, no they um, they commented that their their professor like was telling them to watch this video for their homework or something. I thought that was uh, great, but <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, sweet sounding overheads, man. How were they mic'd? Um, you know, I want to say that that was the Soyuz. Um, at the time, they were called SU-013s. Uh, they dropped the SU, so they're now just uh, Soyuz 013s. Uh, they are FET, uh, actually medium diaphragm condenser mics. They look like small diaphragm, but they're just just ti a tiny bit smaller than a 414. So, are they really small diaphragms or not? But yeah, they sound really great, and that specific compressor, Tegler Audio, um, you boost the lows, and it actually, I don't really like the low end in this unit so much. It, it It's kind of wooly sounding and almost too much for like the 200, 300 kind of area. But for a mic like a small diaphragm, or if I want to make it more sound more like a ribbon mic, basically, I can give it a little boost and I get some of that character back that I'm used to dealing with. And I don't know if it was Space Pair or not. I really don't know. That might have been Space Pair, actually. But at the time, I was playing around with the Soyuz 013s and this compressor. Three reasons why you should use small diaphragms. Um, 31 acoustic guitar. Great for a, bo a, oh, a bong every time you break. Okay, I'll, I'll bite. Acoustic instrument recording. Uh, drum overheads. You can really use small diaphragms. Yeah, acoustic. And I like playing pool too, so. Um, I don't know if you caught this, but I actually, uh, uh, my friends and I, um, uh, there was a pool table at, at my friend Garrett's house, and I actually had his friend Tom actually play the uh, acoustic. The acoustic. <laughs> so now I'm switching it. Now I'm calling the acoustic, uh, creating a chorus from detuning. This is not detune. Or sorry, this is detune, not chorus. Chorus is a delayed detune signal whose pitch is modulated by an LFO, which is low frequency oscillator. And detune is the sound of two different but close pitches wobbling against each other, like when you are tuning a 12 string. Yeah, I mean, I'm not too worried. I mean, do you get value out of the video or not? I mean, yes, like I wanna make sure that my terminology is correct. I remember looking this up. I remember actually like, pretty much quoting my definition as I filmed the video. So I, I know I was careful on my terminology. Um, but at the same time, like if 
you know, if, if you're going to get hung up on something enough to comment, and I, I don't know what the point of commenting is because I'm not going to like, how am I going to modify the video? You know, like, what do you want me to do? I, I, I really don't know. Um, I will say that like, it, it really drives me nuts, you know, like flip the phase, like it's just confusing. There's a lot of confusion on what phase is versus polarity. And, um, you know, I always try to make that one very clear flip polarity. Um, but yeah, I remember being very careful in my terminology on this video, so I don't know why there'd be a problem. Uh, next up, uh, interface update. Yeah, I don't know why I made this video, but, um, you know, I, I don't know what he's talking about. Anybody got into recording? Think of ADAT as, he's just talking about ADAT. Uh, you know, I, I might have been kind of, I kind of had this rant at the time of, um, like interfaces having really high numbers, like uh, 24, eight. And then you, you look on the thing and it's like, okay, I can plug in like four mics. So where's the 28 coming from? You know, it's just like some crazy high number. And I was just like, you know, I was almost thinking like, it was kind of a freebie, like, hey, look, you can record 28 channels. And I'm like, well, I guess, you know, but the reason that I'm buying this piece of equipment is for its conversion. Like that's, I'm upgrading to it, you know, and to get access to those ADAT channels, it's like I'm going back in technology to like a Mo2 Traveler uh, Mark II or Mark III. I think they can be used as a standalone converter, but that's going backwards in technology to, to like 2005, 2006. So if I'm updating, I'm not going to want to use ADAT because I want to use the updated converters. And so I just, I just wonder if those channels should really even be counted in an interface. Um, I just, w I wish there was a more of a standard in that of like, you know, if it ha says eight, it'll be like eight line or eight mic inputs. Okay. Uh, very last video, obliter obliterating a two mic drum mix with compression and overdrive. Uh, this person says studio one looks really nice. looks like it could spread out nicely across multiple strains. Uh, I might try it. Look forward to the studio tour. Great video on compression. I'm missing out. Need to up my game. Jim. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, if you want to up your game, it it could cost you less than $100. I mean, most of us have an interface that will have multiple inputs, but also more than just two outputs. So if you have, say, um, four outputs or eight outputs, um, you can actually get one of these DBX 163Xs, and these go for under $100, um, usually 90 to 100. Um, if you really need one right away, you might have to pay like 120, but I've gotten these for 60, 70, 80 bucks a piece. They actually sound great. And actually, I'm speaking through one now, so I'm actually speaking through the, uh, uh, the 163A. Check, 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 hey, hey, hey. And that's actually like, close to six to eight, 10 dB compression right there. So it's it's kind of crazy um, how much these things can really compress, but still sound good. And so if you want to up your game with some outboard or some compression or whatever, I mean, check these things out. I mean, they're really cheap and they actually sound pretty good. And um, I mean, they sound amazing on kick, amazing on snare, great on, bass, decent on vocals. Sometimes it's a little choppy the way that it kind of comes in, but they're a very, very soft knee compressor. Okay, next up, uh, same video. Mario says, Ryan, that stereo link trick with the compressor was really cool. Going to try that one tomorrow. Yeah, man, let me know how it turns out. I, I'm curious to see what you guys think of these things. And, you know, I was, I was actually, I came up with that with the when I was using a DBX-166, and it's actually the one that I used for the talkback mic video. Um, it's actually over there now because I cleared it out of the way. And um, speaking of which, I actually just took that talkback video. I didn't take it down, but I just kind of unlisted it because I, for some reason, I missed that plugin um, of that, uh, the Sound Radix plugin that automatically mutes your talkback mic when you hit the space bar. Uh, I don't know how I missed that. And so 
I don't think I've ever actually taken a video down like that, but um, I realized that like even my own trick was kind of already out of date and just like not really the best solution. But anyways, back to the topic here. I was playing around with this 166 and I had it routed a vocal routed through a 166. And I'm like, yeah, it sounds okay, you know? And then I did it kind of a serial. And I'm like, okay, you know, yeah. And then I hit the stereo couple button. And all of a sudden, it just behaved differently. Like it just came alive, almost like all buttons mode on 1176. And that's kind of how I figured that out. I, I just had them patched in serial. And it was just a flick of a button. And I'm like, whoa, that's, that's really cool. And all of a sudden, that boring compressor became a lot more interesting. Oh yeah, Recording Studio Tour Part 1. Man, this is an old video. Um, one thing that Ryan has naturally is some audio engineers and producers don't have as the ability to make people feel comfortable and ease. I'm saying this from afar, and I've never met Ryan in person, but I think uh, that quality translates through his channel. Thanks, man. Um, personality and character traits like this go a long way in the studio when... You are tracking and things may be a little hectic already. Things like this are what I look for in a studio. People always ask, what gear do you have? Do you have Neves? Yeah, it's just so annoying. You know, it's like, like, it's really annoying for people to expect that you're going to have this amazing gear just so they can have like an Instagram photo of them in front of it and say, hey, I'm in the studio. You know, um, there's so much more music than that. The more important question, at least from my own point of view, is would I like to hang out with this guy for 18 hours a day for 10 consecutive days? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. I mean, yeah, that's a really good point. Because <laughs> you really don't want to have to create art with somebody that you don't have a, a good vibe with, you know, like, um, if they're just kind of a grump or they're pushy or, um, they're worried about the clock, um, that's going to affect the performance. It's going to affect the, uh, create creativity that happens. So I said this in a comment recently that um, the most important piece of gear that you have is the, the space you record in. But I, I could also say that it's you and it's your interpersonal skills. I mean, are you going to be a jerk or not? You know, um, can you be accommodating? Um, you know, if there is a problem, can you just settle for like small victories and kind of bridge the gap and miscommunication or misunderstanding? Can you, can you like kind of easily set boundaries and say, okay, we are kind of running a little late now, you know, or are you just going to blow up? And then the next day, you know, they're like, man, you got really pissed. And then now that relationship is damaged. You know, there's lots of ways to handle things. And yeah, the, the better you can handle, the better you can handle yourself. Um, I think it goes a long way. And I've always, you know, not so much anymore because I, I just stay so busy with, um, bringing in specifically musicians to, um, film specific, you know, styles of music or songs or whatever, and then, um, experiment with techniques and stuff. But if, if I was to continue with the same model where my main kind of gig is finding clients, bringing them in, recording, and then giving them the recording or the mix, um, if that was my approach, it, then it would still continue to this day where I was getting referrals of referrals, you know, so third generation referrals or more, you know, that, that was really always my goal. And it re really worked. I mean, I would bring in people from the area, any, any place of, um, you know, seven, eight hours drive, you know, I could usually get friends to recommend and then that band would come and, and record. So referrals are really big. And that's the kind of stuff that people don't really worry so much about if you have Neves. It's really about the experience, then them knowing that you're not going to overtake your, uh, or overtake their recording and kind of take control of their creative project. 
Okay, next tip. Operating with two mics. Uh, yeah, the very last video. Uh, Jonathan says, Knight's approach. I like how you are patient and somewhat calculated while taking risks also. Very cool and inspiring. You know, thanks, man. Um, you know, I, I kind of burn at least a good portion of time each day kind of messing with stuff. And... I realized that it's probably cool enough to actually film. And so this was kind of me trying to give you a piece of that. And obviously I'd kind of I'd kind of already, you know, gotten the sounds and stuff, so it's kind of a review or a, a deconstruction. But um I just think it's it's fun to play around with sounds and just to see and experiment and see and, oh what happens if I do this and, and that. So I'll definitely be doing more of that. And I've actually experimented with this in the past um, in the video with the um, the NT20, I'm sorry, the N22 by AEA. Uh, it was like the uh, first test in my honest reaction, something like that. If you go back and look at it, it was kind of me experimenting, but setting up a mic. And so setting up the mic, coming back in, um, it's a little bit of a trickier thing, but I guess just as many cameras. So yeah, I'll be making more of these videos because they are fairly easy and kind of intuitive to create. Next up, uh, the 10 tube amp cranked after three hours of warm up, so the amp shootout. What kind of guitar pickup configuration was used? Man, I don't know. <laughs> um, but it was it was Tyler Powell, and he had a couple guitars, but I I don't think it was the Walmart guitar. And he had a couple others, but he mostly played this Walmart guitar, so it could have been that. Okay. Next up, uh, mixing with outboard video. Cool tricks on the double compression on a mono track with stereo links. I have two TBX 163Xs. I will try this. Yeah, it's not quite the same as the 164. The 163X um, is um, a little bit different sounding. This is the 163, the original, and the 164, which is a stereo version of it, and then the 163. X, and then we have the 163A, which is like the uh, forest green color, which was from the mid-90s, early 90s. But uh, I actually think these sound better. I, I know that sounds cliche, but um, they do all sound a little different. And there's times when the older ones beat out the newer ones. So it's not necessarily that the more vintage ones are better, but the attack and release times are just slightly different, and sometimes you'll notice, like, ooh, like, for this particular source, it actually works better to use this version of that compressor than this other one. Uh, so it's kind of cool to have multiple versions of the same thing. Same thing with the 163XT, the 163X. 163XT, uh, you know, the ones that I have here are actually darker than the 160X. Um, I got this 160X recently for, it was like $70, and um, I, I kind of bought it as like uh, not working or something, and the output was supposed to be super low, but I think what it was is that it just is unbalanced, and it's just more lower than other gear. I, I, I don't, maybe they made a mistake somehow, but anyways, I, I wasn't expecting it to work when it showed up, and um, it seems to work fine. Uh, so it could have been just a misunderstanding. Maybe they thought that it was broken. They sold it. I don't know. But the, the X's have a brighter sound. I mean, they, they actually, I think, do sound better. Um, the one CC uh, XT, um, they sound good as well, but different and different tone. So, yeah, you just got to try it. Next up, Mike says, so I, oh, I so agree with minimal mics on drums. I found I can get a lot more creative just with a stereo pair kick snare mics rather than 
14, lol. Easy to mix, too. Yeah, um... There's, like, more happy accidents that happen when you have more minimal stuff. Because you end up getting to kind of push and pull that a lot more. So, with more mics, you end up kind of combining those mics and just... You know, a lot of times they'll work and they sound really great, and a lot of times more mics can sound better. But at the same time, if you're looking to really go creative and you're looking to do kind of the Chad Blake or um, some other, uh, like like Moses Snyder, like just something more creative of a drum sound, and you want to kind of push and pull and, and, and process those sounds a lot more, a more minimal setup would be better because... Every time you add EQ, for example, you're introducing lots of phase shift, and that's fine, but if you're trying to do that to multiple mics, you're going to affect the relationships of those, of those mics to each other. And if you're only doing it to one mic, then no problem. You know, you don't have a point of reference. It's just that one mic. You can push and pull it all you want, and it'll stay fairly cohesive because it's only one thing. And if it's a good quality microphone, it'll capture it. It'll be really kind of high fidelity sounding. It'll capture lows, mids, you know, top end really well, as long as your placement was good. So minimal mics means more creative, means you can push and shove and kind of tone sculpt a lot more, at least in my experience. Uh, next up... Eric says, great video, just makes me feel excited to try out different things, explore, and experiment after watching your videos. I want to try a two-mic setup soon, and you delivered precious advice and food for thought exactly at the right time. Thanks for sharing your knowledge and for the good work. Yeah, man, I'm glad that I, that this is kind of my goal, is to get you guys to just try stuff, right? I mean... It, it's kind of disappointing, like, if, like, I'll see somebody at NAMM, and I'll be like, cool, so did you try it? And they're like, no. <laughs> it's like, well, tr dude, try it. Like, okay, next up. Incredible mic stands for under 100 bucks. Okay, I guess this link was dead. Okay, he replaced the link. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, Mixing without board. Uh, Johnson says, awesome video, man. Please keep this kind of content coming. I love Studio One. Been using it since 2015. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of features in it that are like, thank you, about time, you know? Uh, so I've been I've been enjoying using it. Um, I guess I almost felt like it was like, um, almost too, uh, almost too popular or... Like, I wasn't, like, the right kind of person to use it or something. Like, maybe I thought it was, like, for songwriters. But there's some really cool features, though, for songwriting. And so, yeah, it has some strength in that area, like chord detection. It'll just tell me what the chords are, which is, like, great, you know? But um, there's just a lot of helpful features in it. I mean, it's just, like, you know, you learn to find where stuff is, and it just flows. Uh, next up. Galileo says, uh, there's a super weird uh, sounding overtone harmonic in the snare, and it's honestly ruined the point of this video for me. Thanks for making this, though. Yeah, I mean, I thought that snare sounded great. So, yeah. Sorry you didn't like the snare drum, but, you know, this is the thing. is like, try it. Like, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try this stuff. Use your own snare, and you know, it's not up to me to, like, do it. Like, you can do it, too, and muffle the heck out of your drum and, and do it. I, you know, I'd like to see, like, what your result is. Um, yeah, Sean and Florian. Um, yeah, you know, I, I just got to Studio One, and I haven't really talked about it so much. Um, the Vanguard Audio Labs, 3 mic Demo Review, Parsons Audio. Uh, he says, or they say, um, uh, Steve says, I own the V44S and it seriously bumped up my overheads when recording on location in particular. Reason being, overheads, for example, 
when I'm in a small room equals cardioid and large room equals fig8 widens up image and catches the room ambience from the rear saves on track count it makes recording so much easier <laughs> you know like you just put it on a stand okay like is it centered come back do a test recording listen okay yeah uh i think the mic is facing exactly down the middle i'm good to go it's so easy it's just such an easy mic to use uh, mixing with outboard um this dot bullet point says uh nice video man would you like to be youtube friends sure what's the different phantom power and what what's different phantom power and focus right one is a brand and one is a type of it's a method of powering condenser mics and various active circuitry at a microphone. Dan on the uh, SM57 uh, shootout says the 78 pile sounded thinner and brighter, but the 57 definitely has more depth, detail, punch than the pile. That's what I'm talking about. So, yeah. It sounds brighter, but you can't, you can't, you can't get distracted by that. You have to really consider the whole picture. Drum gates, drum mixing part four. This is back in 2000. This is probably late spring 2014. What program is this? It looks like Windows XP. Well, it's not a program. It is my studio window right there. I take the camera. I put it on one side of the window, I run around to the other side, I turn off all the lights in the studio, I set up a mic and a light, and I talk to the camera through the window, and I draw on the window. Now this, um, this shot, I haven't done it in a while. I'll pull up the video so you can see what I'm talking about. I haven't done it in a while, and I didn't mean to like stop doing it. Well, hey, my name is Ryan Earnhardt from Creative Sound Lab. Natural attack of the drum to come triggered right here so it's being turned up and then released like this because it's looking to this track here and if you don't have side chaining which is where it... yeah so I haven't done this shot in a while and my light broke that I used for this shot it's kind of a smaller light than my other video lights um, but the shot is ready to go and I'm going to bring that back. 50,000 subs, it seems like a good time, right? New chapter. So, yeah, Tube EQ 12AX7 shootout. Stock tongue sole in the Warm Audio W, uh, the EQP WA versus the Telefunken 12AX7. Tommy says, did not notice too much of a difference between the two, but thanks for putting this up. I'm debating on whether to get one of these units or get one of the mid-price clones like the Amount or Tegler. After all this time, would you still recommend this for tracking on the way in? Do you still use them yourself, or have you upgraded to something else? Thanks again. Well, you know, obviously, um, uh, I still use, uh, I still have at least one here. Um, so it's a valuable tool for tone sculpting. Um, do I think it's the best one out there? I don't, I, I don't know. Like, I haven't used many. Um, I've talked to the guys at Audioscape about uh, reviewing their, uh, their EQP unit. And um, so I'm curious to hear that one. I haven't heard, like, the Clark Technic. I haven't heard Stam Audio. So there are others out there, but I would say that this is, this is really where stuff comes into play on who's making the gear, because it's not just about the look of the gear. I mean, this thing, I think it sounds good. It's served its purpose. It's, I think, way better than a lot of the plugins, and I can easily stand behind what I've said. It's like, it's way better than plugins. I've gotten great results. Um, is there like magic that like the real Poltex, you know, seem to have? 
I don't know, because this Tegler audio, um, this high-end boost actually sounds way smoother than this one. So, uh, Eric Serafin was saying, oh yeah, this reminds me of a real Pultec. You know, this one not so much. Um, so yeah, uh, you just gotta go with what you have. Um, you can't second guess yourself. If you can get good results, then just go with it. I once did a mix with the Baseline uh, Universal Audio um, 1176, like the real cheap like SE version. And then I got like the LN version, which is the black. So it was silver and then black. And I had done like all these mixes and I, I thought that I'd go through and just change out the black for the silver, duplicate the exact settings and then disable the silver and I'd have like a better sound. But it just wasn't quite the same compressor. Even though I had the same settings, I was reacting and adjusting the mix based on the tools that I have. And so it's really hard to say that like you could mix or make better creative things with with a different piece of gear. I think better gear makes it a little bit easier. In fact, it could be a lot easier to get better sounds. But to say that you can just hot swap them and be like, oh yeah, okay, what are the settings? Cool. Let's just load in some other company's gear and put it there and it'll be exactly the same. It's just not going to happen. You know, you've already reacted to what this one is doing and you're going to have to kind of go with that. Uh, next up, drum recording hack everybody forgets to try. This was the one where I, um, where I realized if you adjust the volume at the preamp and you make it so it's like the same volume, you know, like you don't have to play loud. Like you just turn up the, the mics or yeah, you turn up the preamp. So you can use volume as a tool to, to change the tone. And um, you could play soft, you could play loud. It really doesn't matter. We're just gonna record and react to whatever the drummer is giving us. So if you're gonna play loud, cool. We'll just turn you down in here. You're gonna play soft, we'll turn you up. But the thing about that is, is that if we can adjust this, then we could coach the musician and be like, you know, it's not quite, I want, I want a more majestic tom sound. <laughs> um, so play softer if you want majestic. If you want more of a punchy tom sound, then play them loud. So hit them hard. There's like a, a transient that is much, much louder than the actual sustain of the drum. Hit them soft. And that transient, that initial hit, is more on an even level with the sustain. So it may not sound like much, but go through compression, go through the mixing process. Now you have drums that sound absolutely huge. Okay? And that's a big deal. So it, 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 can, it, can, be, it can be a lot. Um, so this guy says uh, one key element here is um, depends on how you hit. Right. You need different dynamics. You can't use the same for all, and only an experienced drummer can give you that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what that's what playing drums uh, is all about. You know, you have to you have to perform each individual you know element of the kit, each individual instrument. So you can't hit the high tom like you would the floor tom, and you have to hit the floor tom just off center. You know, the snare drum, you have to hit just a certain way. You have to lean into the rim shot. On, on this premier 70s uh, Olympic snare, I have to kind of lean into the rim shot and do kind of like a, a, a deep rim shot where I barely kind of hit the rim. Whereas my other drums, I can do kind of a 50-50 mix, you know, even hit with the rim and the actual head of the drum. So... Even the, the variation of rim shots is, I mean, I don't even know how you'd measure this kind of stuff, but just the slightest amount of angle difference can change how the drum responds. And every single hit is actually a very calculated kind of thing. And that's why good drummers are, are hard to find, because you have to really perform each element of the kit, the ride cymbal especially. You, you really control that energy of the whole band. And of course, the fatness goes along with it. So play softer, your playing will get fatter, right? Your drums will sound huge. Um, thinner cymbals. 
they ring out for a little bit longer, and it's kind of as if they're getting compressed already. So add compression. You're not going to have to squash it to get the same results and that same length of cymbal length in a mix. Um, for cymbals that don't ring as long, you're going to have to compress it maybe a little bit more or a little bit more aggressively. So thinner cymbals allow you to use a more minimalistic compression technique on the overheads. And when you have a balanced drummer, then you're not trying to control crazy dynamics. You're really controlling just the tone. You're basically leveling out the tone and helping the tone poke through in a dense mix. That's really what it's all about. If a drummer can't play consistent on the kick drum especially, it, it just drives you nuts, you know, because every single kick hit is going to be different. Some kick hits will have a lot of attack and some not so much. So you go to boost 3K because you need more kick attack. Then they go to the chorus and they all of a sudden start playing louder. Well, you might as well just split off the track there, bump it down, and just treat it as a totally different instrument. Because it kind of is. It's being played differently. It has a different set of EQ needs than the original kick. And so if you boost 3K on the chorus kick where they're really slamming it, then it's, it's going to be like, dude, like turn down the EQ. You know, like it's, it's really aggressive. And that takes a good drummer. Consistency. And again, like, you know, the more the drummer knows how stuff is going to get processed, the better they can play and the better they can kind of anticipate the processing on the back end of compression and, and all that. Just to kind of know, okay, this cymbal is getting loud. It's going to just ruin the room mic, so I'll make sure to not really hit it too loud, but I'm going to kind of lay the the weight of the stick into the cymbal so it washes without being too loud. And that way it simulates being loud, but then the room mics aren't full of cymbal wash. So that's the anticipation, you know. The drummer knows, okay, this will be a problem. I'll play in this certain way. So that's, that's the kind of stuff, you know. So yes, this guy's totally right. Okay, the performance really, really is, is key in all this. You're, it's really hard to fix a bad performance. Okay, 10 tube amps. Wow, this is a popular video. 10 tube amps, cranked. Oh, Jesus, that harmony sounds glorious. The Harmony H303A, yeah. Yeah, it, it did, didn't it? I actually pushed it really hard using the reamp box. And, and I pushed it... Um, Harder than you could in real life, actually. Okay. Vocal recording. Recording vocals without headphones and very little bleed. I think a serious professional singer will spend hours and hours every day getting used to headphones, so I don't think... Uh, I, I don't... So that they don't affect their performance whatsoever. For the rest of us, this technique is amazing. It's great because, as you point out, what it really counts is having the best performance, or the best possible performance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, people that are used to in-ears, they're not going to be really phased by it necessarily. But people that haven't been in the studio much, you just want to make them as comfortable as possible. Okay, vacuum hose drum delay. Uh, let's see here. I like the stereo overheads for the normal setting. Oh yeah, this was just this was just getting nuts. Um, I like all the delay settings. I think that it's very cool that everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know why I go to the John Bonham thing so much, but yeah, like I'm just kind of a, a pocket drummer, and I have a room that is kind of roomy, so I guess that's why I sound like. John Bottom in, in the types of examples that I play. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, putting a mic down, down the hallway, capturing drums at the opposite end, room delay, you know, bottom of the... Yeah, like, all this stuff. You know, try putting mics in the hallway, try putting them in containers and trash cans. 
I actually haven't done that yet. I, I have a metal trash can. I've been wanting to do that for a while. Somebody said the pickle jar thing um, would work, and this was kind of in that, that you know, those couple of months where I was experimenting with these kind of wacky techniques, and somebody said, you know, pickle jar with a little bit of sand, and it, it I don't know, it just didn't sound good. Um, I've also tried the water bottle thing where you put a, um, what is it, a five-gallon water bottle, and it's the type that you flip up upside down for like the, the water cooler. And you put a microphone in that and you put it next to the kick drum. And I've tried that and I don't think it sounds good at all. And I don't know what people are hearing in that to make them want to do that. So if you know, comment below because I don't know what people are going for with that. It just sounds terrible. <laughs> okay, how to create and perform your own Vocal effects. Yeah, so this was with uh, Brian McTeer up at Weathervane Music in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And we're talking about his um, his MW1, the Michael Wagner um, Creation Audio Labs product, which I don't know if they're in business anymore, but uh, Michael Wagner is a really cool guy. Uh, in Nashville, it is a lot of heavy, uh, I mean, legendary uh, albums that he's, he's worked on, and he's, he's renowned for his genre of music and he does tons of guitars and I mean he makes like a really really nice reamp box with impedance control and all these really nice features. We use that going out to a set of uh, pedals and Roland Space Echo and we played vocal through all that crap. And so yeah BFBF BF says is there a way to mix the dry and wet vocals sort of sort of using two, uh, short of using two mics. Well, yeah, because um, usually in a DAW, um, if, you know, if you tell it to detect um, what the delay is, like Logic will do it, uh, Studio One will do it. Um, Logic, it made a pop, so sometimes they'd be like, yeah, like, I'll kill my speakers. Studio One, you don't even hear it, which is pretty slick, but... Um, you just say, you know, detect, and uh, it'll just line that up for you. And then you can actually do a dry, wet mix of stuff that goes out and comes back in versus just the dry. And this is all contained within a single box of the in-out plugin, or uh, for Studio One, it'd be the Pipeline um, XT. If you don't have that, then I would suggest maybe... Um, using a sample or maybe uh, probably a sample click and actually playing that through your vocal chain going back out and then um, then you know exactly how much delay is happening and you can actually take that and scoot it right back where the where the click was and of course you can mute that later but that kind of gives you a reference um, okay next up effect versus optical compression yeah I don't know why I necessarily made this video but they prefer the 76. Cool. Spinning speaker is a microphone. You sound a little sick, are you? No, I'm fine. <laughs> this was um this was three years ago. So I'm I'm okay now. Um at 440 are you recording vocals in stereo or two different mics for more frequency pickup? Well, I don't record uh, vocals in stereo really. But if he's talking about where I had the 17 and the 23 set up at the same time, then that was just to get a comparison easily between the two mics. Or yeah, so yeah, I, I just wanted to see the difference. And um, these mics are in the same family, but they are pretty different. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not planning to use these mics at the same time. I guess you could. Um... I know the Cappy, uh, uh, who was that? Yeah, the Cappy demo video with all the preamps, they had a, an Elam 251 with the SM7B. <laughs> Set it up um, coincidentally for the vocalist. So you could actually blend the 251 with the SM7B. I, I thought that was uh, great. I, I guess that's the thing to do now. Um, but here I was not doing it to do both mics. I literally was just trying to save time. I think we tracked probably 20 vocal takes that day. So 
Okay, uh, recording my worst room and how I made it better. Uh, Steven or Stefan says, uh, what you're recording through and what kind of mics also any e also any EQ compression. Yeah, what am I recording through? That would have been, for that specifically, um, I had Eric's Pacifica preamps in and um, I, he had them over here because we were filming for um, our course that, that we still have available, um, how to record vocals that'll make a grown man weep. And we had his Pacificas here and I wanted to kind of see what they sounded like. And so I set it up in that room because I didn't want to disturb what we were doing in this room. And I thought they sounded great. So on kick and snare on this video, it's actually some Pacifica preamps. Uh, what kind of mics? You know, I don't remember. Actually, that probably would have been the M88 and I want to say the SM57, but it might have been the Audix i5. But you can see it. I mean, if you just watch the video, you can see what mic I was using. So, um, do you really need a reamp box to reamp guitar? Chris says, I've generally found passive DI box in reverse with ground lift and a 20 dB pad does the job. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if it does the job, cool. And if you're using like something like a, a weird effect that is just going to be kind of messed up and jacked up anyhow, I mean, does it really matter if it's like high, high fidelity reamp? Probably not, you know? Probably didn't really matter. But if you want really high quality reproduction as a reamp, then try to get the best thing that you can get. If it's a DI box, then then fine, you know, go with it. At least you're actually doing reamping instead of just like, well, I don't know, you know, and just click through a bunch of presets. So, hey, props to you for actually using the gear that you have. Uh, room mic trick. Get two times the room sound for your drum room microphones. My Room Studio says, I don't have enough inputs in my audio interface for a room mic, so I cheat exporting a room mix of the drums recording before EQ editing the sound and using an ambience room. Oh, yeah, okay. You know, so he's basically uh, creating a fake room sound using a reverb. Cool. Um... I would say to, to add to this, you know, be careful on your balances of how much toms and snare and kick you're sending to your, your reverb to get your fake room sound. I mean, um, a lot of times we mostly want snare, then some toms, and then a little bit of kick. And that kick actually makes it sound like a room mic. That's kind of the secret. But I wouldn't say that you want a lot of low end in a, in a reverb, you know? And it's got to be short, like, you know, real short to actually sound like a room. One actually really great trick is to use samples. So just get some hits around the kit. And it's samples of your own kit. And, uh, you know, process, get all the triggers set up good so that it's hitting. And even if you don't use samples in the mix, you can use those very consistent samples of snare hits, kick hits, toms, and they have no simple wash in those samples, and those samples go to a reverb. So your drum sound is, you could say, all organic, if that's your goal, but then you have samples, and they're nice and clean, and they can, and they can go to a reverb. Now, what would be really cool is uh, you know, they say, I don't have enough inputs. Well, cool. So take your monitor, put it in your room, get a stereo uh, rig, two mics, and record a stereo recording of those, either your, your drum mix or the sample idea that I was talking about. Now you have your real room. It's clean. There's no cymbals. You know, there's just tons of options here, right? So I always think that mixing is a lot of recording and processing. You know, the way that I process is not just through electrical means, 
but it could also be through mechanical and acoustical means. Acoustical? Electronical? Electronical drum set? Okay. Vintage bass amp shootout. Oh yeah, this was fun, because I didn't know like the difference between my amps necessarily. Uh Myers Madness. All three were great. Really no wrong or better choice in the mix. They all were just fine. Soloed it would have been between the Gretsch and the Fender mix-wise. Acoustic stood out. Yeah. Um, oh, this is interesting because it sounded the worst soloed, but mix-wise, it was the best. See, so this right here, this guy is full of wisdom <laughs> because that is key. It's not necessarily what it sounds like right then and there, but you kind of you kind of look ahead and you kind of think, Okay, I know how it sounds now, but how is that going to really go in, in the context of a mix? Just like this pile, it's like, yeah, they're clearer, they have crystal clear sound, but there's going to be nothing left but a faint t tapping sound because there's no body or warmth to the pile mics on a snare drum. So with this, yeah, like, it sounded worse, the worst, soloed, but the best in the context of mix. Yeah, that acoustic amp, one, uh, the 150B, 150B, I think, uh, in solid state. Uh, how to use your room as a reverb effect. Hey, this is what we were just talking about. I was looking for where to place my portable speaker in my room to make it have more reverb, but now I'm about to buy a chamber. Yeah. I mean, you know, you don't have to buy a chamber. You can you can have a room that you just use when you're not recording. You know, like a, a, a living room, you know, roll up your carpet. Any room in your house can be a chamber, okay? So, but I love how they're thinking that it is, it's really like the, the room itself is a part of the mix. It's part of the sound. It's part of the mix. How to reamp guitar, 60 second tutorial. This is a weird one. I don't know why I felt the need to do this, but uh, Nick asked, um, what if I have a stereo pedal? How does that work? What I need to reamp boxes. Also, if I want to use it in my DAW, not on guitars, but vocals, do I still need a reamp box? I would say yes, you need it even more so. If you want to do something hi-fi that you're you're used to having a lot of um, full range um, frequencies, then yeah, like you're gonna notice it if if it's got a weird sound to it. So use a reamp box for the best result. For a stereo pedal, no, but you're gonna need two uh, DI boxes to get back in. So again, you can just, you can say, oh, here's a hole and just plug something in and be like, oh, I got sound, let's record it. Or you can use the tools kind of as they're developed and kind of as they're meant to be used and you'll most likely get a better result, uh, but it's up to you. Okay, comparing four vintage tube amp tremolos. Jack says, my favorites were the Brown Fender and the Gibson Scout. The black fender was almost not there, and the Gretsch was too dark. Interesting. It was almost not there. Yeah, the depths of tremolos are um, really interesting, you know? I don't know if I like the black fender. It's something about the shape, the shape of it. Okay, so we use 023. How does it compare to the, the Neumann uh, U47 FET? Well, the FET 47, they could actually compare because a lot of people are taking that Lomo um, 1989 or the 19A19, and they're taking that. The the 19A9 is like an Art Deco kind of side address mic. The 19A19 is a front address mic, and they both are um, decently expensive, actually, but they're way cheaper than a 47. And they're tube, and they're often compared to a U47. So these Lomo mics, uh, the Lomos are probably sitting right there with the 47s in their tone, kind of in that, that middle, uh, middle frequency kind of push. 
So it'll probably compare really nice to that. But I've never had a Neumann Fett U47, so I can't say. Ape says, uh, this is a great comparison. Would, oh yeah, would love to see the same thing. Different guitars, different amp. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really cool. Um, they're, they're not really my mics. Um, but I could maybe make that video again someday. But, you know, there's not many people making videos about really old mics like this. So I just figured, like, I got to have something, right? Um, so, yeah, I decided on the distorted guitar thing. At least it's out there. It's a reference. Maybe I can develop a reference for uh, the same people that are interest, interested in old mics in the future, but for now, at least I got it out there. Man, the Toms, excelente. Yeah. I mean, every time I heard in editing, I heard those Toms, I was like blown away. I was like, it just sounds so good. <laughs> and I don't know why more people didn't freak out about the Tom sound. At 149. Uh, Manuel says, really nice reggaeton. Let's hear it. Oh, yeah. My gosh. Oh. Yeah, that sounds really good. Um, I used to salsa dance in uh, college. I was in the salsa band at Florida State, and um, I don't know much. I don't know much Spanish, but I I'd like to think that I have real good pronunciation on a few words. And um, I, I usually ask people like, "Hey, how's my accent?" You know. <laughs> and uh, so, but I don't know many words, so I just kind of do a cycle of like four words over and over again, and they're pretty much like. Reggaeton, salsa, bachata, uh, asuga, and then I start over again. And then, like one girl was like, "You should probably learn some more words." Uh, but yeah, reggaeton. Zach on the Soyuz video. This mic sounds great in a lot of arenas, areas. Uh, I'd love to get my hands on one, test it out, put it through its paces. Yeah, I mean, if you can get a hold of one. Um, definitely check it out. I don't know if you're in the area, but I'm a couple hours north of Atlanta. Uh, Taylor asks, Ryan, at 825, there's a lot, there's a large black cylinder in the room. What is that? Is it a moonshine still? Uh, I don't know. You know, I was at a, um, I was at, at a Dollar General here in town, and there was a couple of people, uh, talking in front of me about a batch of moonshine they had just made. Yeah, that's the R88. <laughs> this is not a moonshine st still. It is the AEA R88. <laughs> okay, nice video. Uh, guitar. Fet versus optical compression. Um, this fit sucks. Thanks. Um, I mean, maybe it does suck. I, I don't know. I mean... There, there's been times where like I had like an hour to make a video. Sometimes you just gotta say I could do what I can do and make the best thing that I could make for that week. If I'm moving slowly, it's better than not moving at all. So that was me moving slowly for that week, but I still progressed and I made more videos after that. So at least I didn't put it down and forget to come back. And the next thing you know, it's like, well, what happened to Creative Sound Lab? Is, is there stuff four years ago that you'd still stand behind? I mean, maybe not. Maybe, but, you know. And YouTube, like, it just stays up there. It just, forever. It could just stay up there. Yeah, like, three bad habits of electric guitar recording. See, I, I don't know that I would make this video <laughs> currently. Um, Kyle says, I love your presentation style, but I respectfully disagree with most of those points in the first section of the video. For anyone curious, oh my gosh. You know, I was able to get really good results using minimal gear. And a lot of times I was able to do it with one mic. So um, I remember saying something about, 
you know, it's a bad habit just to like automatically set up a bunch of mics. Okay. Um, I don't think it's a good habit to be in an autopilot mode where you're just kind of doing things to do things. Do you need more than one mic? I mean, try it, listen to it. Like, did you listen before you set up two mics? Um, so those are the things that are bad habits. Now, I've done a, a, a guitar recording course, and I set up a lot of mics, and I learned, like, oh, wow, like, this this actually I, I, I would do. You know, this this I do again, and this over here, okay, that really is terrible, but, okay, this actually I was wrong on, and I've I've since changed. So, I mean, there's stuff that, that like, yeah, like, I'm learning every day, and um, this is one area where it's like, hmm, yeah, I might want to maybe redo that video, or kind of make like a version two of it. How how do you like your vocal solo uh, sixes? Really, really just didn't like them for the longest time. And I think that I was using the on the onboard EQ and I was trying to kind of adjust to the room. But as you know, and as you see it in plugins, you, you do like a dip and then it makes kind of a, a bump at the crossover at, or at the frequency. And so it actually was bumping up certain areas of my room that actually I'm kind of sensitive to, like 100, 110 hertz, 120 hertz, kind of muddy low end kind of stuff for kick drum, stuff like that. And so I was convinced that like there was too much low mids in these monitors. But what it was is I was using the onboard EQ and it was actually causing that. And I had this weird thing where I thought I blew a tweeter and I was like really bummed about it. I'm like, man, you know, so I took one out, I put one in the middle and just by moving the monitor, I'm like, well, it's not in the corner anymore. I should just take off the EQ and just listen. And I took off the EQ because I think I shaved a lot of the low end off. And I was like, doesn't sound so bad, you know? And the next day, just by chance, I said, you know, I'll bring in that monitor again. Just see, like, maybe, like, my magic, the tweeter would just work again. And for some reason, it was working. So I don't know if it was, like, the scratchy knob on this uh, uh, gain train over here or, or what, what was going on. But um, all I knew is that I had two tweeters and two monitors working correctly. And... I turned off the EQ, so I turned off the EQ there, and I was like, whoa, like, okay, you know, this is why EQ can mess up so much stuff so quickly, is, you know, if you just leave it alone, you might be surprised at how good the raw sound actually is. And I thought that was just for mics, but it turns out that they're for monitors as well. Um, so yeah, if you can just use something straight up then you might be surprised how good it actually is. Okay, so I'm getting uh, kind of uh, brain fogged out right now, but let me know what you think of this quick fire Q and A uh, and if I should do it again sometime. Talk to you soon in the comments.